Uh, good evening and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Giacomo De Stefano, the director of the Patterson Museum. And on behalf of the Patterson Museum Foundation, who's sponsoring these uh, <clears throat> webinars for us, I, I you know, owe a tremendous debt of gratitude. This is the uh, final one for this season. We'll be preparing for September. This is our next ex uh, our next talk for uh, uh, the story behind the story, Conversations with Ed Smike. And you see he's joined by the, by the president of the Patterson Museum Foundation, Glenn Corbett. And uh, when you have any questions, I ask that you place them in the Q&A. And at the end of the uh, seminar, we will, uh, we will address them. And then, of course, this is also a little chance for us to donate a little money and feel good for the uh, museum. And the uh, link for that you'll find in the chat. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Smike, county historian. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think this is a really interesting uh, program about Mark Twain's uh, visit to Patterson, New Jersey on January 31st, 1872. There was some confusion over the exact date he was to appear in Patterson. And they, he thought that he was going to be here on February 1st, but there was, there was a bit of confusion over the date. So he wrote his agent, James Redpath, who was a rather uh, interesting character un unto himself. <laughs> he, said, he said that Patterson wails and weeps for February 1st. And they're still weeping. And they're still weeping. <laughs> So we, we can put up our, the first photo of, uh, of, of, uh, of our subject tonight. Of our subject, yeah, Mr. Twain, number one. Uh, this is a photo that we all kind of embedded in our memory is the, uh, the older Mark Twain. This is how he looked in 1906. He lived from 1835 to 1910. So this formal portrait was taken um, six years before he died at his Italian style villa in Reading, Connecticut. As I said, after a lifetime of spirited living, he is enshrined in our nation's history as the quintessential American novelist, humorist, known internationally, known and internationally admired as a literary icon. Uh, his immense literary output continues to excite our collective imaginations. Now people ask, and I've been asked several times, and you, you probably, to Glenn is where did he come up with the name Samuel Langhorn Clemens, uh, rather Mark Twain. His real name is Samuel Langhorn Clemens. And um, he took it from the nautical language used on the Mississippi River where Twain himself was a riverboat pilot. Right. right. And Mark Twain literally means Mark II, the safe navigable, navigable depth of 12 feet. But there's, a, there's still debate to this day as to you know, how that name originated. And Mark Twain told Yale professor William Lyon Phelps that he appropriated it from the Mississippi riverboat pilot, I say I asked Sellers, who ended up as a character in, in one of his novels. Uh, he, Sellers submitted to, to the uh, New Orleans newspapers, articles on river, river doings, signing them as Mark Twain. So Clemens related that Sellers, and this is exactly what Mark Twain told William Lyon Phelps. He said, he died in 1863, meaning Sellers. I liked the name and stole it. I think I have done him no wrong for I seem to have made this name somewhat generally known. The problem with that tale is that there's no record of Sellers ever signing his articles Mark Twain. <laughs> Clemens first used it in February, 1863, more than a year before Sellers died. So it's those little historical uh, enigmas that continue to tan tantalize us to this day. Well, his whole life is full of those, right? We'll talk about Mark. We're going to talk about Tom Sawyer in a little while, but his whole life is filled with these enigmas that, that come up and, and, and start pinning things down. Is it's it's a it's a very foggy situation with his, with his uh, you know yeah. his his life basically and who where he appropriated things from and what have you. So. But yeah, he Sir, is. A, Sir Edward Elgar wrote a, 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 a musical work called Enigma Variations. And I kind of think of That's Twain him. in that context That's him. as uh, a man of immense um, creativity and intelligence and, <laughs> and, and, and these endless enigmas right. that have tantalized, tantalized researchers and scholars right. even during his lifetime. And historians love to 
pin things down to black and white and specifics and things like that. And so this is a guy you can't do this with, right? I mean, this is a no. guy that there's all these, these mysteries about a lot, a lot of parts of um, particularly his writings and other things. And when you look at his, the Mark Twain papers project at the, at the University of California, I mean, it's, it's staggering how much this man produced and how much he wrote. Yep. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, well, this photo is, was, was uh, provided to me by the Mark Twain house and very grateful that we could use it. Up in Hartford, Connecticut. Yes, that's correct. Very good. And now let's go to Mark Twain, the next uh, portrait, how he appeared in, on February 7th, 1871. And there he is. Dashing young guy. A year before his Patterson visit. And the portrait was taken by the celebrated Matthew Brady in his photographic studio at Broadway and Fulton Street, New York. Uh, with Twain's agile stage presence and cascade of words, he cut an impressive figure on the lecture circuit. Twain described himself as, quote, born in 1835, five feet, eight and a half inches tall, weighed about 145 pounds, dark brown hair and red mustache, full face with very high ears and light gray, beautiful beaming eyes and a damn good moral character. <laughs> that says a lot right there. That says a lot right there. So he, he comes to Patterson in 1871. This is pretty much what he would have looked like. In the yeah, yeah, yes, so that would look a year later. That's yeah. how he looked. Yeah. Um, and so he, you know, to put this in context, I mean, he, he was at this point, he's pretty well known. I mean, for his writings, I mean, it, He's nationally point. known. Nationally he's nationally known, known now. now, maybe even internationally known. And so he's touring the country giving lectures, which was a in the 19th century. That was, you know, the rock concerts of today, basically. They went around from city to city to make presentations. Of course, there's no other way to sort of actually see someone and hear from them. So this is this was a, a tradition. You know, we think about Charles Dickens coming to the United States and giving his lecture series throughout, you know, throughout uh, the eastern seaboard. And so he he follows into the same category of of literally um, working to of course to make money to to live, but doing it on a, on a lecture circuit. And here in Patterson, um, there were other folks who came to Patterson to give lectures. I, I found one several years ago in the 1850s. Uh, the a whole bunch of esteemed citizens in Patterson invited in. Uh, a lecture to talk about issues of chemistry of all things. So, so this was, a, I mean, you think about it, no television, no radio, not a lot of things here, no internet, certainly no Facebook. So this was, this was a major, major event when he came to town here, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And, and you know, you, when you think of the stamina that you needed in those days to go on the lecture tour in 1871, making connections, going to cities, finding lodgings, it was quite a thing. And he did it from October to uh, February of 1870, 18, uh, excuse me, October 1871 to February 1872. And the, the, uh, the tour did take, as I have found, as I've read, a palpable toll on his energies. In mid-February of 1872, and I think this is important, he wrote his lifelong friend, Mary Mason Fairbanks, saying the experience was, that is the lecture tour the most detestable lecture campaign that ever was. A feeling a burden had been lifted. He was glad the tour had mercifully ended. He said, quote, I lectured 11 or $12,000 worth and came out of the campaign with less, with less than $1,500 to show for all that work and misery. And he said, quote, I ain't ever gonna lecture anymore unless I get in debt again. And that's what he was trying to do. He was gonna pay off his debts because Mark Twain was kind of prodigal with money. And he was very generous, but he got involved in in that typesetting, uh, like a line of type, line of type machine, which poured a ton of money into bankrupt, it. it was a effectively bankrupted him. So he uh, he was constantly having to go on tour, and you know to understand this too that he was literally traveling from city to city, right? So um, he was in Jersey City before he came to Patterson. Yeah, he was he there was on in, January thirtieth. So here he is the next day here in Patterson. And, and where does he head to after that? Troy, New York. Troy, New York, yeah. And he was in Scranton a few days earlier. So literally, if you think about the rock 
stars of today with the t-shirts that people buy to constantly list out all the cities they were in. So this is what this guy was doing, giving lectures. And, and it was just basically him on the road. There was anybody with him. He was doing all this organization, think about this, by letters with his with his agent for all intents and purposes. So this is very complicated. It, it was complicated. He, he lectures in Jersey City to an overflowing house. And remember, he's 36 years old, got a lot of energy. And then he undoubtedly took the ferry back to New York. On the 31st, he's listed in the New York Tribune as among the prominent arrivals in New York City, where he checked in the St. Nicholas Hotel. The next day, he recrossed the river and he came to Patterson, where he stayed overnight at the Franklin House, which we have a photo of in a little while, as you can see. And then after leaving Patterson, again, he goes to a, quote, jammed house in Troy, New York, where he kept the audience convulsed with laughter. And he was back in Hartford to celebrate his second wedding anniversary on February 2nd. Quite a guy. Quite a guy. Interesting. So do you think he probably, uh, I mean, he? we only know of him coming here once for that lecture. No, so, this is the only time he was Right, so that's the only time he was here. So it's very likely he probably would have went to see the local uh, landscape and of course the big attraction even back then was the falls right? he probably he probably could have gone he, he had that he may have gone we don't know so far we, we don't know if he went to the falls or not right uh when this big but this business uh, occurred over the lecture date he told redpath that uh again patterson wails and weeps for him redpath was an amazing uh personality he was a uh a writer for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. And in 1869, he established the Boston Lyceum Bureau, booking Mark Twain for two long tours. And the last, the uh, latter one was from October 1871 to February 1872. The two men eventually became um, uh, fast friends. And in connection with, with this confusion, he, Ridpath, <laughs> wrote Twain on March 18th, 18th, uh, January 18th, excuse me, 1872. He wrote, Dear Mark, when you reach Patterson, New Jersey, you will find possibly, probably an indignant secretary who threatens, I think, for his language seems to smell of gunpowder. <laughs> they, co they, co they complain to you of our, of our course and refusing to give him February, as the statements will probably end in an appeal for an abatement of fee, for an abatement of fee, I write to say, quote, don't abate, and then explain the case as it stands. And uh, I'll, I, we, I'll go to this later on, but that mm. secretary uh, was, I'm pretty sure, a Patterson physician by the name of John Nottingham. Right, right. So you want to take a look at the landscape now of Patterson back then? Yeah, we can go. Okay, uh, so we'll go number to number three. three. Yep. So of course we know this view. Very yeah, there's our there's a view of the Passaic Falls that was taken by the uh, the great Patterson's own Matthew Brady, John Reed, and this is uh, dates from the 1860s, but the early 1860s. But this is what we're trained, uh, Twain would have marveled at. Uh, the view is looking north from the old Chasm Bridge, and uh, actually talking about John Reed, uh, we're we're likely in the fall when our new fall series comes out with uh, chats with Ed Smike. Um, we'll actually be having a, uh, a webinar about John Reed himself. So uh, looking forward to that. So, but this is one of, again, John is is the Matthew Brady of of, uh, of Patterson. So, and of course, we think Twain probably went there. I mean, it's- It know, seems unlikely that he, he would just have With his curiosity, he, yeah. he had to have seen it. Right, right. So, so there you go, there you go. So we're gonna take a look at a street scene next. Yeah. I. I put in a couple of these photos to, to give everybody a context of uh, what, what Patterson, Patterson looked like at the time of uh, Twain's visit. And uh, in the 1870s, it was a bustling town. Uh, this photo was taken by Vernon Royal, a corporate executive who enjoyed t relaxing by photographing the city and other localities in Pasay County. This is the Main Street Bridge about 1872, the year Twain visited. You can see um, there's a First Baptist in the corner there, see it? Yes. Uh, above mm -hmm. the uh, smokestack. Um, so, uh, yep, yep. So this is this is this is sort of this is on the Manchester side or the uh, Total Road side of of the, of the river, looking toward Main Street downtown. 
exactly. Uh, we can go to the next one. This is a very famous John Reed view. And um, Patterson, at the time this was taken, and the in about 1860, 64, 65, uh, Patterson did not have any tall buildings, but it retained a certain small town charm. The population stood at 35,579 inhabitants. And 10 years later, the national census counted an additional 17,371 souls. Patterson, of course, was on the move. The big clock, uh, it's shown to the immediate the top left of the photo was the um, the uh, uh, town clock, the town clock in the Dutch Reformed Church on Main Street near Ellison. And that was a, a notable building in the city, and uh, this photo actually was a few years earlier than before Mark Twain came. And so, when he would have looked down the same view, um, he wouldn't have seen the clock in 1872 because it burned down it burned in 1871. 1871. Yeah, so, it was gone by then. It was a major fire downtown. So, uh, but it gives you a sense of all the surrounding buildings, the landscape, mostly three, two, three. It's sort of a panoramic three. view, but yeah. we're gonna we're gonna get a little closer here. We're gonna right. Let's go to let's go to the next one, number six. It's again the old town clock. Yeah. This was a, a watercolor of um, the old town clock and adjacent buildings on Main Street, uh, just before the fire. Now, this is about 1869, 1870. And it was a watercolor done by an Abraham Ward. And it was part of the wonderful collection assembled by the great Patterson collector, Esther Ip Schwartz. And Mrs. Schwartz gave me a print of that. She used to send, them, send out these uh, photographs of the wonderful paintings that she had in watercolors as Christmas cards, right. uh, season's greetings cards. Right. So I just thought that was nice to see what the town looked like. Yeah. And she was a generous donor. She gave a lot of material to the Passaic County Historical Society. And yeah, as a, life, a, a lifetime honorary trustee too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for all of her benef benefactions, so to speak. Right, exactly. So this is, this is Main Street, Patterson. Mm -hmm. So that's what, what Twain would have seen. All right, we'll go to number seven. Now, this is definitely what Twain would have encountered. Um, Main Street looking south with Garrett Mountain in the distance. And this is about 1868. Uh, pretty much the scene he would have found during his Patterson visit, except that Reed's photo was taken during the summer months. Right. And you can see, again, the old town clock. And uh, the street was unpaved. There's, there's almost all of the all of the streets in the city were at that time. Right. And to the right is the office of the Patterson Daily Press, which which covered uh, wrote about his uh, his lecture. Yeah. So some of the some of the quotes you have and some of the material you got actually came out of that office right there. So that, that's correct. That's where it that's, was written, right where we were looking that, at. That's, right that's correct. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Very good. So um, so like I said, this is what he was seeing, and, and at the time. The, the, you know, tr you know, a couple points Ed made earlier about the population increase, uh, 13,000 people in 10 years. This is the point after the Civil War, Patterson is growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, it's just growing exponentially. Um, years ago, when I did research on the Patterson fire of 1902, it was remarkable. If you looked at each 10 year decade leading up to the fire, the leap, it was incredible the amount of new people that were coming into the city to of course, for the most part, fill the silk mill, dye house uh, jobs that needed to be done. So, so this is really kind of the beginning post Civil War um, explosion and growth of Patterson. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, this is where the uh, the spirit of, of industry really was taking off at that period of industrial supremacy. Yep. yep. Which uh, has been very well chronicled in. Uh, uh, Trumbull's Trumbull's uh, in, history of industrial Levy industrial. Levy R. Trumbull's history of industrial Patterson right. published in 1882 I believe right right and the other thing too is that this is becoming a regional center for commerce as well I mean this is where it is I mean if you lived in uh a J, you know in areas uh, which are now today you know other parts you know, nearby parts of Bergen County or Wayne or uh further south and things this is where you came to do your shopping and stuff and of course, the, the railroad back then is the way of, that, that Twain would have gotten to Patterson. 
And the route of the railroad was slightly different back then. It actually came closer to Main Street than, of course, we all know the railroad today follows Straight Street uh, up, you know, up to, to go north and south. So, but again, this is this is what he would have seen coming in. So, which was which is intelligent because this is where all the businesses basically were developing right, right. along Main Street. Right. So we want to look at the Franklin House next. Yeah, let's go to the next photo. Okay. This is an ad. This is an ad that came out of the 1872 uh, Patterson Directory, and this is the the hotel that accommodated um, Mark Twain. Uh, the it was a, it was a pretty well known place of comfortable lodgings for out of town travelers. Right. And it John, was a, it was the Alexander Hamilton Hotel of its day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. Much smaller, but much yeah. small, much yeah. smaller, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I really liked about this one is uh, I did some research on the owner, John W. Miller, and you could. What I found out about him, he was a very amiable guy, and he would have been the person to welcome his auspicious guest. He'd been operating the hotel since 1855, and uh, touted in the directory, which you can see that attached to this hotel was a first class restaurant, which I'm sure delighted Mark Twain. Who, he was a culinary he expert. Was a, he, was, he, was, he, he, enjoy, he enjoyed good food. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a, that's a nice woodcut. It is. And the directories of those days say, thank God they have these wonderful woodcuts of some of the buildings and uh, which are so valuable for any of the kind of research anyone wants to do. Right. So a director, so everybody knows if we're familiar with them. A city director. City right. directory. These were predecessors to the telephone book, basically, in, in the various cities, because larger cities, you wanted to know where people lived, uh, perhaps what kind of work they did and things. So these were literally telephone like books that would tell you who you know who lived where and what have you. So this is this is, you know, again, this one is literally from the year that he came here. So we go to the next one, number nine. Now there is a view of the Franklin House, and that is, again, pretty much the street that Mark Twain walked. Uh, this is a, a crop view about 1860. And we can go to the next one, number 10, which is a, a larger shot showing, again, about 1860, uh, of uh, the west side of Main Street with the Franklin House is the third building from the left. Again, another John Reed uh, photograph. And Reed had to take and uh, lug his enormous view camera, sensitize the plate, hope that there was good weather because the emulsions were incredibly slow, and took this wonderful photograph. Well, this is basically right near Mill and Markets, for, for, uh, excuse me, Market and Main uh streets today so this is where this is basically right near there so um and you notice the other thing in this photograph look at all the trees here on main street <laughs> there, yes. aren't, there aren't any of those left no so. they're, they're long <laughs> gone oh, God. so well, you know while it was a growing city it, as i said it had a quaintness it had a charm about it mm -hmm. and you notice they they really thought a lot about those trees if you notice they're all boxed at their base to keep uh, from being damaged, getting hit by wagons, dogs doing their business, whatever, they protected these trees so that they were growing. They were made out of wood. They were yeah, like wooden wood, enclosures. Wood, wood frames, yeah. right? Exactly. So, so again, interesting things. All right, we'll go to the next photo, and uh, this is the old Patterson Opera House on Main Street. It was photographed at the blizzard of 1888. So far, I've not been able to come up with a better photo of this. Uh, it's probably a read photo, a read photo, don't know. Uh, presumably, this is the venue, this is the building where he, in which he spoke, where every, almost every inch of, quote, standing room was taken. And this was originally opened in uh, April of 1866 by John Waldron, Walden, uh, a man who was really like Patterson's first theatrical entrepreneur. And it was known for years as Walden's Opera House. In the words of theater historian Mary C. Henderson, who did a very nice uh, monograph on the early Patterson Opera House, she said the name was, quote, the age's polite euphemism for a theater. 
<laughs> yeah, the building the building was destroyed by fire in the early morning hours of November second, nineteen hundred, when flames erupted in the rear and the, where scenery and other inflammable materials were stored. So don't be mis don't be misled by this sort of small facade here. Um, as you know, in New York City, a lot of the theaters, you know, you realize once you're in the actual theater, it's much larger because they very often own the property behind there. So they, they use this as an entry portal to get in and then sort of expand it once you're inside the actual building. Yeah, it was quite large. Right. Yeah. So um, so this is the building in which he gave his lecture. I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty yeah, sure. This it is, is it. Yeah, this is it. This is it. And uh, his lecture actually was, um, so again, put it in context here. Remember, he's going from city to city, talking about his his adventures that he had written about. And this particular uh, this particular um, series of lectures for that particular called season, uh, which again, dozens of cities, uh, it was it was wrapped around his war his 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 um, trips westward. Because a lot of people know him, of course, for his uh, his uh, Mississippi riverboat work, right? So we talked earlier about how the name Mark Twain came about, but he also is pretty well known for his his excursions into the West, and that was the subject matter of the lecture here in Patterson. And if you think about it, this is again 1870s, early 70s, not too long after the Civil War, not really too long after the Gold Rush, right? In the uh, 4950. So there's a lot of people that are very interested in what's going on in this new state of California and all these territories out there where he's the guy who actually experienced it. So the, the lecture series was entitled Roughing It, and it was all about him going from Missouri out to uh, first meet with his brother, who was a secretary, of the, the Nevada Orion. governor. Yeah. Right, right. And so yeah. and he, he ends up, again, just like Ed said before, he needed money. So he ends up in these different places doing different kinds of jobs. He thought about being a prospector in the mines. Uh, he ends up in Virginia City, um, at, of course, trying to dealing with the mining situation doesn't work out for him. So he becomes a reporter for the local newspaper in Virginia City. Eventually, he works his way out to Lake Tahoe and all the way to California. And of course, the famous uh, time period in the 1860s when he's in San Francisco, which was a really quite a place back then as it is today was uh, it, was, it was it was a wild place it was a wild place where so many buccaneers, so many buccaneers yeah, and oh East, easterners from new york philadelphia baltimore boston they all went out there for the gold rush and what's interesting a little story a, lot of, a number of people from patterson went out yeah a number of people including john stagg the patterson's first paid fire and nathan barnett nathan barnett the, the he's an old gold rush guy. He was a gold yeah. rush guy too. Nathan Bornett, the mayor of Patterson and <laughs> they, benefactor. Yeah. They listened to Horace Greeley, go west young man, right? Yeah. So they listened to yeah. him and went out there. And so Mark Twain is out there. He spends quite a bit of time out there. And he, you know, it, it was interesting to me is that um, as a, a fire person, I, you know, I, I'm a professor at John Jay as a fire, teaching fire science and things like that. Um, he hooks up with a man by the name of Tom Sawyer. And Tom Sawyer was first the New York City volunteer firemen, and so many of them went to California. They're the ones who organized the very first uh, volunteer fire in San Francisco, which only lasted from 1859 to 66. The city was growing so quickly, they literally moved in 60 could have paid the department. But Tom Sawyer was a pretty, uh, his, 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 um, his, certainly his, his physical profile was, was, he was a big man. He uh, literally ran a bar in San Francisco where uh, Mark Twain got to be friendly with him and they were long friends for many, many years later. And of course, it's one of those situations where, you know, when he wrote Huckleberry Finn, I wrote about Huckleberry Finn and about Tom Sawyer, there's no question in most people's mind that he in fact named him after um, his friend from San Francisco who was a, again, a volunteer fireman. So. So anyway, he meets lots of people in all sorts of interesting places. Um, but again, his lecture here in Patterson was about, again, was entitled Roughing It. So, but the interesting thing is that Twain also wrote up this lecture, boxed lecture in, in book form, but what's missing from it is all the sort of before and after the actual lecture. So we hear a lot the, about the Western you stuff. You know, the quips. The quips. So yeah. I, I, this is just so interesting to me. There was a, 
two weeks before he was in Patterson, he's in Lansing, Michigan. And someone up there in a newspaper actually uh, transcribed his entire lecture, including roughing it and the stuff before and after. Well, here's an interesting little quote from him. It's, it's kind of well, not too lengthy, but uh, one thing about Mark Twain is apparently he didn't like being complimented a lot. So listen to this. Mark Twain says, I never had but one public introduction that seemed to me just exactly the thing, an introduction brimful of grace. Why? It was sort of inspiration, yet the man who made it wasn't acquainted with me, but he was sensible to the backbone and he said to me, now, you, wouldn't, you don't want any compliments? He asked, of course, I did not want any compliments at all. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I shan't fool away any unnecessary time in this introduction. <laughs> I don't know anything about this man. At least I know only two things. One, he has never been in a penitentiary. And the other is, I don't know why he wasn't in one. Such an introduction puts the man at his ease right off. So that's it gives you a little flavor. And he, I'm sure he repeated the same thing here. We don't know what Nottingham would have said or, or any of the other folks here in Patterson, but I would bet you something like that probably popped up that night. So he, he was just a, I mean, listen, we, we think of him as a humorist. That's what he was. He was a he was a, not only a novelist, but he was so funny, right? You know, in, in, in connection with the preparations for the, for the, for the appearance in Patterson, uh, a woman by the name of Lynn Salama, who is uh, one of the very astute editors for the Mark Twain Project, she was the one in correspondence who came up with the name of Jay Nottingham, uh, who was Twain's Patterson contact. Right. And what what it, this confusion about him appearing in Patterson was somewhat caused by him because what, what, they, what she had found out in going through his, his lectures uh, and his notebooks and his other entries that uh, he sent a telegram uh, by in complicated matters, that's Mark Twain, by absentmindedly agreeing to lecture in Patterson on February 1st. And he was yielding to the importunities of a Patterson Lecture Committee at the YMCA that had been waiting since August for confirmation of an early February date. And that's why they got very angry. And I think that when, they, when we, talk, we talked about this guy who smelled of gunpowder, it's the, it's the indignant secretary. It could have been Nottingham, but you know we don't know for sure. And, well, I said, well, how do you know, how do you, you know for certain that this is the same Nottingham that was at the, the lecture? Well, when I checked the 1872, 1873 directory, 73, 1874 directory, there's only one Nottingham in Patterson. It's got to be him. And that's him. Right. And he was a physician, a homeopathic physician, couldn't find anything on him. Uh, and Bob Hayskamp, the librarian emeritus at the Historical Society, did. And uh, he uncovered biographical information that Nottingham was born in New York State. He studied medicine with a local doctor, Dr. Theodore Y. Kinney. And um, according to a, a huge biographical sketch, which was published in one of the county histories up there, so Nottingham was a man of rugged honesty, upright in, in all his dealings, and his word was as good as his bond. Now, I tried to run down the, the next logical place look would be the minutes of the YMCA. So they who sponsored the lecture and uh, because they presumably derived some income from it as a benefit. Right. And when I contacted the Y uh, here in Patterson, I was told the, the records and minutes no longer existed. And that was back in 2007. But it seems to me it's a little bit improbable for not for Nottingham was described as it's really amiable, uh, old fashioned physician. Uh, Not a guy with gunpowder. Use, use gun a way that smells of gunpowder. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, one one thing about Twain, you know, he's prolific. We're just prolific, writing all the time. He told his wife in, a, in a, Olivia in a letter dated seven January that the lecture business up to the ends of up to the end of January yielded only about ten thousand dollars. But he said, quote, but the money had all gone and it's going for those necessity, necessities of life. And the necessities of life, whereas he, he punctuated were debts. He exclaimed twice in the letter, but this is what he said. I do hate lecturing, reiterating that lecturing is, is hateful, but it must come to an end yet. And then I'll see my darling, whom I love, love, 
love in italics. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. So he, uh, you know, just just a just an American, uh, you know, American, um, you know, uh, just American impressive uh, qualities and things. So, um, so he's, so he's, he's one yeah. of these guys that uh, would be called an in, a in the American game. Yeah, treasure in the American great guy. Yeah. Now the subject is this lecture, roughing it. He did not see the book. He only saw the book when he got, I think, three hundred and four copies when he when he finished at right. the end of the lecture. Too. Right. It was the second major book, and it amounted to 172,000 plus words in 79 chapters <laughs> with illustrations. And he embroidered on many episodes and invented others. And it took, um, it was based on his five and a half years, as you said, he spent in the far west during the 1860s. Right. right. And it contained some of the best humorous writing. Um, right. He was able to see the first um, copies of Roughing It when he returned. The 304 copies were sent to him. But um, I guess we'll go into exactly what the Patterson, two, pa two Patterson newspapers said about the, the lecture. And this is all we have so far been able to uncover. Uh, and, you know, scholarship is always advancing and uh, letters and turn up all the time. Right. That we think we have everything, but. Right. We found that we don't, but um, uh, there was a, a little bit of a tease article in the Patterson Daily Press on the 30th announcing Twain's impending arrival, saying, uh, quote, tomorrow night, everybody will have a chance to laugh and grow fat <laughs> by hearing Mark Twain, the celebrated humorous lecture on roughing it at the Opera House for the benefits of the YMCA. And the press, the press carried an account of the lecture in Thursday, the next, the next day's paper, February 1st, saying he introduced himself in his characteristic way as a lank, awkward fellow from beyond the settlements, <laughs> but with a, an amazing amount of brass in his face. <laughs> and I gathered that that must mean an, an amazing confidence right. or... Uh, <laughs> Right. An amazing uh, aura, or, aura, or yeah. maybe yeah, just, a projection of oh, great oh, confidence and yeah, even right. brass in his face. I love that expression. Uh, the paper asserted, "quote It would be unfair to report his lecture. That would be larceny." <laughs> but gave some of the highlights. Yeah. Uh, a description of life in Nevada in 1863, when the silver mining fever was at its height. Was at its height. And the society was one of the roughest character. This is what the press said. Uh, the, re the reporter explained, Twain gave a beautiful and eloquent description of Lake Tahoe, 9,000 feet above the ocean and 100 miles in circumference set like a crystal mirror in a frame, frame of pine and snow clad mountains. Now you have to remember that the people that were in Patterson, they had lived here, many of them lived here for a long time People did not have the, the means or the money to travel. So lectures on other parts of the country and Europe were really very important things for right. people to go. It was great entertainment. Right, it was. It was, because even photography at this point is still, you know, for the for the for the masses is still fairly early. I it's mean, out of the reach of the masses. Right. That's at why this point. you know you're familiar with stereo views. Those are the original ways of letting people know what other parts of the world look like. So this having someone who was there. And describing, particularly someone like Twain, who uh, is so eloquent and, and the, you know, language, the words that he used, all that really painted a picture for these folks in Patterson. Here. Now that this this man is a cornucopia of um, of events. Uh, the press reporter said that he was greeted by an audience that fairly crowded the building, but everybody was not pleased, noting, quote. Very few are ever satisfied with the humorous lecture. But the lecturer was about all that could have been reasonably expected. And those who were disappointed were so because they had anticipated too much. <laughs> <laughs> now, in trying to find the uh, uh, press account from the other newspaper, couldn't find it. 
and I'm pretty sure at the time when I checked this, the library didn't have the, the microfilm for that. Some of them were missing. Right. But Edward M. Graff, who was my mentor at the Say County Historical Society, and he was in a, a, a diligent re researcher to the point of being a fanatic about it, he went to the library in the 1930s and copied what was in the paper, what was in the Guardian. Right. So we have it. And uh, they carried a, a, a short report on the lecture, and I'm just going to read some of the highlights of it. Quote, every seat in the orchestra, parquet and gallery, every private box, and almost every inch of standing room in the opera house last evening was appropriated by the immense audience assembled to hear the much anticipated lecture of Mark Twain on roughing it. The reviewer thought it was, quote, no doubt a tolerably accurate description of three years spent in the bottom, which was interspe interspersed with those serial comic Twainisms, <laughs> which have won for him his great reputation. The writer considered the lecture, quote, very enjoyable, but its principal fault was, his bre was its brevity. And it's amazing how people see things so much so differently you know right, right. that it was he thought it was you know too short for right. what he had done right 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 and you think i mean he's given this lecture dozens of times before in other cities across the across the country and we and patterson was one of the last ones he gave it to so uh i guess well, he people, was pretty he was pretty tired at this he point, was you know, know you know i guess people have high expectations of what kind of entertainment they're gonna have but i mean he was again he was no more wide at this point so so, um, so again, but I, I think, you know, certainly was not a negative review reviews of him. Um, I think, you know, again, just surmising from what we, what Ed has said here, we can establish that he, you know, people did enjoy it, I'm sure, you know, and again, the money was, was most likely being, uh, raised for the then relatively new YMCA. Um, and we're not talking about the building that's over on, uh, Ward street there. We're talking about. Uh, an earlier, an earlier, an down, earlier one, right behind yeah. City Hall, basically. So, um, so, but again, it was, it, you know, we were on the map, right? Patterson well, was know, on the map for, for well, having. What are the things that other that other cities do, even when the building no longer exists, and you right. can see it in nearby in, in Montclair? Their historic preservation uh, people put up a little a little uh, bronze plaque, right. and there's a little story yeah. about a famous person who came to town, and they. Yeah. And that, that's what we should do here because right. there are so many interesting stories. And right. a, a future program I, I'd like to do is when uh, the British philosopher mathematician uh, Bertrand Russell lectured here. Right. Um, Will Durant, who later with his wife, Will and Ariel Durant, wrote The Magnificent Story of Civilization. Right. He lectured here. There were a lot of very, very well known literary people who came here. And, and it's great to be able to bring these things back to the fore so people can look at Patterson in, in its historical context. Right, right. There were many, many people that came to the city um, because there was a lot of interest in things like this. And, uh, and we had, you know, Patterson had the ability to uh, provide venues for these folks to give their lectures. And, and again, a, a base of, uh, of people who really were interested in this kind of stuff. So, so um, we want, we want, yeah. Good. We'll go to the next photo. And what I'm, yes, this was the a rebuilt Patterson Opera House. Uh, again, that was at uh, 284 Main Street. After the fire. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, this was, this was, uh, uh, it was reconstructed. And this one was, it was done in a, in a, uh, a more, when it was reconstructed, it was done in this style. And that building was severely damaged uh, in a fire on January 6, 1914. And these buildings, you know, well, you as a fire expert and a, as an authority on this can tell us a lot about how, you know, they would always advertise when they'd rebuild it. It was fireproof because theaters are a, have been and were a source of conflagrations. They stored scenery, they stored inflammable liquids in back and right and you think about uh, lecture earlier lecture you had about timothy crane his uh his son um lost a child in the chicago iroquois theater fire which is america's worst that was a horrible theater fire, fire. In, uh, in, uh, in 1906 
So, um, so these buildings, ironically, when they use the word fireproof, that's, we don't use that language anymore because really nothing is that. But, um, you know, basically that building, the one in Chicago and even ones like this did actually survive these fires and are re reused, right? Uh, renovated and, and repopulated with new theaters. So, so this one became uh, a movie theater. Yes. Right. This, this was, re, it was redesigned as a movie theater. And later on, uh, you don't see it here in this photograph, but all of those uh, windows were beautifully stained glass creations and they were magnificent. And I, I actually remember that theater. It was sold to the Adam, Adams brothers who on March 6, 1916, uh, opened it as a movie, movie house and with much patriotic fanfare. And it was renamed the U.S. Photoplay Theater. And when I was a kid, we'd say, we're going to the U.S. Theater. And they screened this patriotic epic, epic called The Battle Cry of, of Peace and later movies like The Phantom of the Opera starring Lon Chaney. <laughs> it's an interesting family story in connection with that. That my great aunt Fanny went to see Lon Chaney in that theater uh, when, when the Phantom of the Opera was playing and when, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a horror story and, and Lon Chaney was the man and the man right. of a thousand faces right. and the makeup is actually, even to this right. day, it's horrifying, right. you know, right. for 1916. And when right. he rips off the mask, right. my aunt starts screaming and runs right. from the U S theater. See, so that's a little family story. Quite, quite, it was quite, uh, quite something back then because people had never experienced things like that, you know, and, Especially on film, basically. Yeah, and of course you had you had an you had an orchestra and you had right. at least someone playing the piano or later the organ. They were all silent films back then. So the the building which had started out, as you can see right on the front, this building as the the second or third Patterson Opera House, it managed to survive until mid nineteen sixty nine when it was raised to make way for a parking lot. As so, many, unfortunately, as many buildings as, have as many met have, that fate. As many buildings have, and it was a beautiful but when i i have a photograph a photograph of it and it's uh can construct a demolition stage when the beautiful cornice had been ripped off and they had put some cheap uh, uh, br uh br brick face on it i just they didn't want to repair the cornice okay but the beautiful stained glass windows had been salvaged they were gone okay so and, somebody got them and it was a shame because the contract was given to the otilio brothers and there was some sort of a problem about dem demolishing this and other buildings in Patterson. And uh, Frank Graves, who everybody remembers as one of the uh, more vigorous, shall I say, Patterson mayors, he complained that he was trying to make a campaign issue out of it. He said, you know, this, is, uh, this building hasn't been taken down yet, but it was in June of 1969. And that's, that's about when it was really, mm -hmm. really torn down. Mm -hmm. So that really was kind of the end of the uh, Patterson Opera House, uh, mem at least memories of the Patterson Opera House right. in Patterson from 1866 until 1969, which was quite a was quite a yeah, run. Right. Yeah. So I got two other photos. Uh, we go to the next one. There is Mark Twain uh, wearing the uh, doctoral robe of uh, an honorary doctoral letters from Oxford University which Oxford University conferred upon him, the University of Oxford on 21 June, 1907. And he once quipped that he wasn't, he was, he wasn't gonna to return to England unless some, something important happened. And when they nominated him for the uh, conferral of the degree, he was delighted with it. And he spent four weeks in England. There's a book out on it. Yeah. And uh, he was deluged with invitations and he received the university's scarlet um, doctoral gown, which you can see him wearing with his characteristic uh, white suits, which he, which he wore towards the, the end of his life. And uh, he prized it to the point of childish delight. According to his, one of his biographers, Fred Kaplan, he said colorful costumes had always appealed to him. He donned the gown at every opportunity, whether appropriate or not. Among them, his daughter, Cla among them at his daughter Clara's wedding. <laughs> this photo was He's taken. quite the character. He was, he, he was something. 
<laughs> the photo was taken in England by Alvin Langdon Coburn using the autochrome uh, process, which is an early type of color photography. Incredible. And I thought the last photo um, shows a pensive Mark Twain, also 1907, reading a book dressed in a, a, a colorful scarlet dressing uh, a robe. And he was an individualist right to the end of his life. This is also an autochrome color photo uh, uh, taken again during that 1907 visit. And uh, these are in the collections of the Royal Photographic, Royal Photographic Society in Bath, England. And again, they're real color photos. It's, it was an elaborate process to make an order back then. Yeah, yeah. Back then, because photos are only just starting to get into new, just even black and white into newspapers. To think we have color photography. Yeah, they were experimental, but right. it's very nice that we. No, have it them. is. It's incredible, and you know, uh, you know, and he passed away not too much, uh, much later after this. Nineteen ten, yeah. Yeah, three years later, and uh, we still talk about him to this day. I mean, if anyone's interested, of course. Uh, many of you might be familiar that um, one of the homes that he owned, of course, for many years was in Hartford, uh, right next to Harriet Beecher Stowe, right? The, um, uh, or in our own right, the, I can't remember the, the name of the guy, um, you know, right up there in Hartford. So if you're looking to learn a little bit more about Mark Twain, that's an excellent, uh, wonderful place to go. They have house tours up there and all sorts of uh, different types of events and things. So, so um, Ed? Oh, I have yeah. I'm a couple, okay. two, more, two okay. more little tidbits on yeah. Mark Twain. Um, I find a article that was in the May 27th, 1885 Patterson Daily Press, this fantastic article reporting, reporting that a Patterson woman by the name of Charlotte Frances Shotwell was the original Miss Laura Hawkins. Hawkins, a female lobbyist in Mark Twain's Gilded Age, a tale of today. And uh, I did some more digging and on July, 20, July 26, 1874, the Chicago Tribune published a sensational account of this lady's trials and tribulations, including where she was allegedly robbed of bonds worth $50,000. Now this this woman was a, a real character. The Laura the Laura Hawkins story was it was absolute nonsense, and it was hinted that Ms. Shotwell, who used other aliases, was a clever swindler. There you go. <laughs> so, and we still have those today. And we still have them today. <laughs> and there's another very interesting story that when the Passaic County Historical Society was being formed in 1926, they wanted to try to get as, as much as possible representation from geographic representation of the membership. And a man by the name of William Montgomery Clemens was elected to the first board of trustees. He became one of the vice presidents, second vice president of the society, and he signed the papers of incorporation. So he was among the 20 some incorporators of the society. And the, um, um, he was a really well-known author, journalist, a genealogist, and a collector of manuscripts, a manuscript authority lived in Pompton Lakes. Uh, he claimed that he was related to Mark Twain. Same last name. Same Samuel, the uh, same Clemens name. Right. Yeah, William Montgomery Clemens. He claimed he was, he was named. He was. <laughs> so, so anyway, now I couldn't really find much on him and I didn't find anything on him in the standard, you know, well-researched uh, uh, that other scholars have done on, right. on him. Right. So I started to do more digging on him. And sure enough, in the New York Times, there's this big article. Mm -hmm. And the same article with variation appeared in newspapers across the country. It said he was his nephew. Another paper said it was his cousin. Well, there was a blog on William Montgomery Clemens and uh, a genealogy blog, which I came across. Published a letter from Clemens' great-grandson. Who disavowed, who disavowed any knowledge, a letter from Clemens, this is William, William Montgomery Clemens' great grandson, who disavowed any relationship to Mark Twain, claiming his great grandfather had indulged in wishful thinking, <laughs> saying, My guess is that he invented the connection to help market himself. And the, new, the newspapers, including the Times, they just accepted it as fact. 
Right. But William Montgomery, he was a solid guy. He did right. a lot of stuff on marriage right. records. A very well known right. genealogist. Right. But I he, 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 he fell victim to to uh, to some to wishful thinking. Wishful but thinking. I think he, I think he wanted to make that connection. So, so people he, like the New York Times who and other newspapers say, well, he's related. Oh to, yeah, yeah. To Mark he's a Twain. descendant. Exactly. Excellent. So, so this has been a a lot of fun. As Do you want to talk quick about the books? Too, yeah, in, people yeah, in a minute. Sure. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to learn more about Mark Twain, I mean, I've got, I've, I've really looked at a lot of the literature and I have a number of the books, but on him, this is one of the best biographies published by Ron Powers. And this came out in 2005. It's called Mark Twain, A Life by Ron Powers. It's extremely well documented and very well written. An excellent, excellent book. This is a very, very good book, too, by Shelley Fisher Fishkin. It's called Lighting Out for the Territory, Reflections on Mark Twain in American Culture. Very, very worthwhile reading, published by um, Oxford University Press. Ironically. And that was done a while ago in 1997. But this is a book of, 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 of really great reading it's, a, it's like an encyclopedia, Mark Twain, A to Z, by R. Kent Rasmussen. And it, it's loaded with synopses, little known facts about Twain. Uh, some, some of the things that I used in this lecture came out of this book. It's called The Essential Reference to His Life and Writings and well worth looking at. Oh, he's quite the guy. And we had him here for one night in Patterson. So. We had him for one one night in Patterson, and he, <laughs> he stayed at the Franklin House, and then he went off to uh, he lit out for the territory. For territory, so <laughs> Troy, New York, upstate New York. So, okay. So, thank you, Ed. That was that was wonderful. Uh, Jack, do we have any questions in the box? No, I think you took care of just about everything. Uh, we did have a couple of comments. I think we have to improve our microphone service. Okay. Okay. So okay. we'll work on that for the next one, I promise. But okay. uh, no other questions or uh, well, anything th in the this chat. Is, this is the the essence of this. These chats, a little known, little known facts and stories about people that came on the historical stage in Patterson, and uh, yeah, it's just it's a it's a it's very enjoyable to do them and to share that knowledge. And I hope all of you who are listening that you'll find these lectures interesting enough that you'll go out and also do a little research on your own. Right. Because it's, again, I always say this is a voyage of discovery, right, Glenn? And we're, exactly. we're always learning more and more. We're always finding new things. And, and this has been a wonderful opportunity. I uh, want to thank, before we leave tonight, I want to thank Dave Ferrari. I want to thank Dave and, and our, Jack, too, our, for everything they're doing here. Yes, and Jack as well. Our, Dave is our, our, uh, our foundation uh, secretary. And so he's, he is literally, again, the wizard behind the curtain here. He's behind our logo there. So, and of course, Jack, a lot of us know Jack as, as the, just, just a, this incredible guy that we have uh, here at the Patterson Museum. So I appreciate you saying that because one of my board of trustees, Dennis, who's one of our faithful viewers, you know, did write us that he enjoyed the conversation and the efforts to put Twain's visit in, into local context. So. Dennis appreciates that. Thank you, Thank Dennis. You. Thank you. Thank Dennis. you, Dennis. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And so, I think we got one other compliment from Angelo Cifaldi. Thank oh. you. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Yeah, so, um, so the plan is to have more of these again starting in September. So just to refresh everybody's memory, uh, we have this series with Ed. It's uh, Stories Behind the Story. And then we also have a, a more traditional uh, set of lectures via PowerPoint webinar. Um, which we'll have those again in the fall as well. So uh, what, in a few weeks, this particular video, that you, uh, this particular webinar you saw tonight will be posted to YouTube. Please go there, um, take a look at the other ones from previous uh, sessions that we've had. Um, we hope you enjoy them. And if you've got suggestions for other ones, we certainly would like to hear from you. And uh, if you can, again, if you feel the, feel the urge to help support us in what we do, uh, here at the foundation, uh, we would appreciate it. We've got a lot of projects uh, rolling along here, and uh, we're excited about a lot of we're excited about the future for the Patterson Museum. So, thank you all for coming, Jack. Thank you, and Dave. So I'm gonna, I, would, thank you. I yeah. appreciate all that you do for us. Thank I'd you. like to say you're welcome, but also, yes, thank you, Glenn, for everything you do for MCing tonight. 
problem. Thanks and a lot, Dave. And the, I did put the link up in the uh, in the chat for the donation page. Very good. So, well, I I hope everybody to see everybody in the in September uh, when we're going to do our next one. Right. Probably going to be on John Reed. John Reed, the great photographer, prolific photographer, prolific. Yep. And there's plenty of examples of his work, ladies Tons and gentlemen. Tons of things. Maybe a few that you've never seen before too. We're going to try to do that. That's, that's right. Something. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting story about his studio. What happened to it? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, thank you, everyone. And uh, as they say, we'll see you in September. See you in September. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it all. Bye. Care, Thanks, guys. guys. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Dave.